<laughs> well, I've been an um, interventional radiologist here at Stanford for, I think this is my eighth year. And uh, today I'll talk about interventional oncology, and I'll expand a little from the liver to actually kidney, too. Uh, so I'll give you a complete uh, overview. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. And uh, this is my team, my interventional radiologist that partners uh, that I work with every single day. These, I'm an interventional radiologist, which is a subset or subspecialty of diagnostic radiology. You may have gone, got CT scans and MRIs. Uh, I'm in that same department, but I use the imaging to do minimally invasive procedures. Each one of us has a specialty, and my specialty is interventional oncology. This is where I go to work every single day. Uh, it's great at dinner parties, people ask me, what do you do for a living? It's very hard to explain. When I say I'm a radiologist, people think I work on radios and, uh, <laughs> or take films. I, but I'm lucky I get to go here every single day. And uh, what you see before you is, uh, this is a, a, fluor a fluoroscopic machine, uh, x-ray machine. So the patient, oh good, you see the arrow. The patient lies here on the table and uh, x-rays come from below through the patient and then get imaged uh, from this detector right above the patient. So uh, this is a real-time imaging and I use those images which get projected onto a large, actually it's not multiple screens anymore, it's a big like 70 inch monitor uh, in front of me and I get to see what I'm doing inside of the person in real time. So I'm operating inside of people uh, through small incisions in the body using x-ray or ultrasound or CT guidance. And underneath all this sterile uh, paper is lead <laughs> because of the x-rays. So um, I wear about 20 pounds of lead every single day, get a good workout. And this is what I use, uh, the tools to do my procedures, uh, needles, uh, wires, small little catheters or uh, tubing to basically travel through the body, through the blood vessels or veins uh, to get to where I'm going and uh, do my operation. Today I'm gonna focus on renal cell carcinoma and of course it's a common uh, cancer in the kidney, however a very uncommon uh, cancer you know, compared to the entire gamut of uh, cancers. Uh, also people who develop uh, renal cell carcinoma of that small percent some travel to the liver, and I'll talk about treatments within the liver as well. I'm the uh, kind of local uh, regional therapy guy, the kind of the SWAT team that goes in there and uh, stamps out the cancer and treats it at the location where it's at. So today I'm gonna focus on uh, ablation on the kidney and then the liver, and then I'm gonna talk about liver-directed therapies uh, in the liver, and that'll be chemoembolization, which is delivering chemotherapy directly to the liver, and radioembolization, which is direct, uh, delivering radiation uh, directly to the liver. It's a form of brachiotherapy. So first I'll start uh, with ablation, and that's basically destruction of tissues. And within the liver, we generally burn tissues by using RFA, which is radiofrequency ablation, or microwave. And we go in there, we stick probes into the uh, liver, and we will basically destroy tissues by heating it up and cooking it. Within the uh, kidney, we uh, place in probes, but instead of burning the tissue, we'll freeze the tissue until um, it's destroyed. So just, that's the eyes, Paul. So let me just talk about cryoablation and uh, the kidney. So cryoablation is just, uh, comes from, to break down the word, is cryo meaning cold, ablation meaning tissue destruction. So we're destroying tissue using very, very cold temperatures, uh, negative 40 degrees uh, Celsius. And uh, we're able to do this uh, within the uh, kidney and uh, destroy the uh, tumor cells themselves. So the different ways about destroying or getting the probes into the kidney, um, urologists also do this as well. They do open cryoablation, meaning they would do surgery, incision, uh, see the kidney, stick the probes directly into the uh, kidney cancer. Or they can do it laparoscopically by you know, placing in uh, little ports, blowing up the ab uh, retroperitoneum, or I mean, the space around the kidney, and then uh, putting in the probes uh, directly. Uh, my favorite, the way I do it, uh, is not of the two choices above, but percutaneous. And percutaneous means through the skin. 
And that's how interventional radiologists pretty much do everything. We're, we're kind of the Band-Aid surgery people because we uh, just make a small little incision, uh, put our tools inside a person, and uh, we guide them the probes there by using CT. So you probably all, most people have gotten a CT scan here, and we use that donut CT scanner to put our probes exactly within the tumor and then freeze the tissue. There are no large incisions, and most people are discharged the next day. So a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm just gonna show you a little video here. It's basically, here's the CT scanner. You're lying on your stomach. Usually, um, we do it under conscious uh, sedation, meaning no general anesthesia. Uh, the uh, tumor is there in the kidney. We'll place uh, multiple probes, usually about 17 gauge uh, needles, into the uh, tumor, and then uh, freeze at the tip of the uh, uh, needles using pressurized gases, argon and helium, and then we'll do a cycling of freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, and uh, the tissue gets destroyed uh, when it cycles through this kind of freezing and thawing uh, cycle, and uh, we're able to spare all the kidney around it and be very targeted in our uh, treatment. And uh, as you probably know, freezing doesn't hurt as much as burning yourself, so that's why we're able to do this under uh, conscious sedation rather than putting you under general anesthesia. If we were to burn something, we would definitely put you under general anesthesia because that is much more painful. So this is the probe that we stick into people, and um, it's uh, a 17 gauge needle, and it has a hollow chamber, and you pump in pressurized gas, uh, helium first, and it freezes at the tip and creates an ice ball, and which expands over time, and then uh, you unfreeze it or thaw it out using uh, argon, so using noble gases for all those people in chemistry uh, to uh, basically freeze and thaw uh, tumors. So here's a little um, diagram. So here are the tumor cells. They're floating in some extracellular fluid. And uh, the difference is that uh, the tumor cells have a different concentration of ions compared to the surrounding extracellular fluid. And we take advantage of that, and that also changes the uh, freezing, um, how fast they freeze. The outside freezes faster than the cell. And then uh, when it freezes, and this difference in freezing, it causes the ions to move out of the cell the uh, cell shrinks, then we thaw, and then it's still a little frozen in the cell, and then that begins to thaw, and then the uh, little ions go back into the cell, cause it to swell, and then burst. So that's how the actual killing part uh, happens with uh, freezing and thawing. So it's uh, very effective, this percutaneous uh, cryoablation, 87% uh, effective rate compared to, um, still laparoscopic is uh, more uh, effective at 94%. It's nicer because short hospital stay, you go home the next day, and uh, about 85% uh, five-year recurrence-free recurrence -free survival. And if there's any residual tumor, we can always go back in and touch it up. So go back in and uh, ablate again. Uh, so these are um, kind of bits and pieces of the cell, so they're not live. So the, it usually just gets reabsorbed over time. Uh, yes, uh, four centimeters. So I would say it's like the Goldilocks of, you know, for ablation, it's all like Goldilocks. It has to be just right, you know, just the right size, just the right location. And uh, that way we can do cryoablation. Not everyone's a candidate uh, for it. Yes? Um, is there any use um, on um, heart disease and cancer cells to help that? Yes, to the liver, we'll, the liver. Liver, we'll uh, I'll talk about that. We generally use the microwave or the uh, radiofrequency ablation for that, uh, just because we have more experience in data. We lung, we will do microwave. Um, some there's also uh, external beam radiation, so there are there are different choices depending on uh, where it has metastasized to. Does that include the nose system as well? Um, you can do nodes, but they're much harder because um, usually it's location. The nodes are usually surrounding very important structures like arteries, veins. 
things like that. So you don't want to uh, destroy those. No, it's hard because of the location and also, uh, yeah, it, it, because it has to be just the right location because you're in danger of destroying surrounding tissue. So, uh, spares kidney, yeah. So the risk of the procedure is what I just talked about uh, is destroying nearby tissues. Uh, for example, um, getting into the uh, collecting system of the uh, kidney, uh, you know, intestines, anything kind of nearby where you're trying to ablate, burn. And uh, it is, can be painful afterwards. It usually lasts about a week and it feels uh, sore. And uh, bleeding is also a risk, but it's about 2% complication rate. And uh, size, it's uh, four centimeters. We can't ablate really large uh, tumors because we'll miss pieces of it. And uh, because you just, it only makes little circles and when you do overlap You'll, there's only so much overlap of circles before you kind of miss pieces of it because you, we only can burn in circles and small circles at that. Uh, usually it has to be uh, towards the back. It has to uh, almost be hanging off the kidney. It makes it much easier for us. If it's more central, it's difficult because you, know, you have important blood vessels, the collecting system, it's just uh, more challenging and I think at, at that point it would be more surgery. And uh, usually cryoablation is reserved for patients who can't undergo surgery or you know, have one kidney left and you can't take out the last kidney, otherwise you go to dialysis. So that was uh, local regional therapy for the kidney and now I'm gonna move on to the liver. So the liver we generally burn just because we have more uh, experience uh, with that, and this is radiofrequency ablation, sticking in probes inside the liver and uh, putting a current through it and heating up the tissue until it cooks. And it's also very similar to cryoablation of the liver, I mean of the kidney, you know, liver is very important on location as well. Location is very important because it can't be near very important structures like the colon, gallbladder, large um, blood vessels, otherwise it'll suck away the heat. So it has to be kind of just right, and it can't be uh, too sick. And usually uh, ablation is reserved for people who can't undergo surgery to resect the tumors. And once again, size is the most important thing. Usually less than three centimeters uh, for us to get a, you know, over 90% uh, success rate. And when you're getting into the larger, like three to five centimeters, it's kind of like on the borderline, and above five centimeters, no, because we're not able to completely uh, kill the uh, tumor. So that, yes? Heart, oh, that's for like uh, EP? Yeah, arrhythmias. They, yeah, it's similar, but I think there are different, for us it's like a slow cook, because it's sort of like a, the Thanksgiving turkey where you can't really cook it really fast and you're trying to cook a large uh, area. Uh, we have a, a cycle that we go through and it's similar technology but applied differently. So uh, for tumors, now I'm gonna talk about tumors within the liver that are too big. You can't ablate, you can't go undergo surgery. Uh, now we're going into the realm of liver-directed therapy where uh, we generally have two choices, either deliver uh, chemotherapy directly to the tumor or deliver radioactive beads. And uh, the way we go about doing it is we puncture the artery near the groin, because that's a large artery. Then using x-ray guidance, we'll snake our little tubes and wires up into the liver, and then uh, we will take pictures, or we call angiograms, pictures of the arteries using our x-ray machine to map out what arteries feed the tumors. Then uh, we will bring our little tube directly to the artery that feeds the uh, cancer, and we will inject in chemotherapy to the uh, tumor itself. So it's very different than taking a pill or in get injection in the veins because we're delivering the fight directly to the tumor. And the reason why uh, this is good is because we're reducing systemic toxicities and we're able to deliver higher levels of chemotherapy directly uh, to the tumors and uh, essentially marinate uh, the tumors in chemotherapy. And what we use is uh, drug eluting beads with doxorubicin. These are small little beads uh, with uh, chemotherapy stuck on them, and these beads are biocompatible, and the uh, drug kind of just 
leaks out of it over the course of about two weeks. And um, you stay overnight in the hospital and then go home the next day. Uh, most people are a, a candidate if your liver function is intact and your functional status is good, meaning you're, you know, like everyone here, able to carry on their activities of daily living. And uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of data with um, renal cell carcinoma and chemoembolization. Chemoembolization is mainly used for uh, primary tumors within the liver, like hepatocellular carcinoma and um, also uh, neuroendocrine tumors. But for the experience with uh, renal cell carcinoma, chemoembolization hasn't been that great. Most of the time you just get stable uh, disease after a treatment, so we haven't been so excited about using chemoembolization on uh, tumors within the liver or metastasis. Uh, but it is an option and something we think about to give directed therapy. A better option would be radioembolization. And radioembolization is a, instead of injecting little beads with chemotherapy, injecting beads with radiation uh, loaded onto them. And uh, you're delivering high levels of radiation, about 100 to 3,000 gray. Just to give you a sense of how much that is, it only takes about 70 gray to destroy tumors, and you're delivering uh, multiple folds more uh, than is necessary. And these little beads are uh, delivered through a small little tube, just the same way as chemoembolization. We puncture the artery in the groin, travel up to the liver, and we inject it into the uh, liver itself. And What's the half-life of the 64 hours. And so the radiation's pretty much gone after about two months. And the reason why we're able to do this in the liver, we can't do it anywhere else. We've done it one time in the kidney, and we're still waiting for uh, results on that. Uh, but essentially the kidney is a special or I mean the liver is a special organ has a dual blood supply 70% of the blood supply is comes from the portal vein about 30% from the hepatic artery if you were just to inject the uh, little radioactive beads into the liver it would just kind of spread all the way around evenly distributing uh, into the liver and essentially kill the liver but you throw in a tumor in there very hypervascular, meaning lots of blood vessels, hungry little guy, and it's getting almost 100% of its blood supply from the uh, liver artery. Then you inject in these radioactive particles, and they'll concentrate up within the tumor about three or 10 to one compared to the background, and essentially radiate the tumor from the inside out. This is more radiation than you can hope to achieve from the external beam radiation, where they shine the radiation oncologist, where they shine the radiation from the outside in because there's a lot of good tissue to go through before you hit a tumor. And the liver is a very radiosensitive organ. So here are the beads uh, under electron microscope. They're about 30 microns, so one third the width of a human hair. And I'll just pass around this little sample which is non-radioactive. <laughs> for people to look at. So that is the human hair right next to it, so you can see what it looks like in comparison. And there are two brands, Surspheres and Therospheres, and we use Surspheres um, uh, to uh, deliver the uh, radioactive particles. Uh, it's used for colorectal cancer. Therospheres are used for hepatocellular carcinoma, but we can use them for renal cell carcinoma as well. So they're made in a nuclear reactor. So those little beads that you see there, uh, they're yttrium-89. They pop them into the nuclear reactor. They can become yttrium-90, uh, which is a pure beta emitter. And what that means to you is that it, the ionizing or damaging radiation only acts two and a half millimeters away from that sphere. So it kills very locally. Maximum penetration, 11 millimeters, and the half-life is 64 hours and they're attached to biocompatible spheres. Um, one comes from Canada, the other one comes from Australia, and then it decays to uh, zirconium. So it, it'll be uh, inert after a little uh, while, two months. So the people who are a candidate for this kind of treatment are people who have metastasis uh, to the liver and uh, predominant. So I always ask the question, what's gonna kill the patient? Is it gonna be the little lymph nodes, you know, maybe in the retroperitoneum, or is it the big masses within the liver? If the answer is the big masses in the liver, then uh, you're a candidate for this treatment, and provided that you have a good functional status, meaning you're able to you know, get around, you're not sleeping more than half the day. Uh, these are people who are trying to maintain their quality of life and to help them live longer. We're definitely not a cure for cancer, but the whole purpose and treatment of our um, 
of our uh, radio mobilization is to help people live better. So the way we go about doing it is you'll see us in clinic. Uh, we'll talk about this procedure. We'll answer all your questions. We're even on YouTube. You can see our videos if you like uh, beforehand. And then we'll go for and um, get it authorized by the insurance company. And it'll be two outpatient two to three outpatient procedures, meaning no overnight stay in the hospital. And then we'll meet again to uh, make sure you recovered from the radio mobilization, and also we'll get imaging or follow-up imaging in about uh, 10 to 12 weeks, and we'll meet again to go over the imaging and to uh, basically discuss uh, what to do next. We always work in conjunction with oncologists, uh, surgeons. We work as a big team in tumor boards and things like that uh, in order to determine what is the best care. So we never work in a vacuum. It's a a huge team um, uh, working. So the first outpatient procedure when you come to Stanford is we'll map out the arteries to see what arteries feed the tumors. But more importantly, we'll look for the arteries that lead away from the liver. Sometimes there are small little arteries that go to the stomach or the duodenum, and we want to plug them up permanently uh, with coils. You're not going to miss those arteries. Uh, you're not going to feel it. But it does make it safer for us to receive the radioactive particles later. We don't want it to cause ulcers. And that's what you're seeing here is little ulcers and beads within the stomach because your, your gut is very sensitive to radiation. And um, we want to avoid that kind of complication. Even though we're super careful, still uh, ulcers happen in about 4% of our patients. And after we make it safe, we'll inject in a radioactive tracer to um, see where are those particles going to go once we inject them. Most of them will stay in the liver. Some will pass through the liver and go to the lung. And based upon the amount that's going to the lung, so this is kind of the mapping, what it looks like, how much is in the liver and how much is in the lung. Based upon that uh, shunt, based upon your liver volume, I will order the dose made special at the nuclear reactor because we don't have it sitting on our shelf. You're going to come back a week later. It's going to be FedExed over. You're going to come back in for another outpatient procedure where we uh, puncture the artery, travel up to the liver again, and then deliver the radioactive particles directly to the liver. And we use this little complex box, uh, so basically we don't uh, radiate ourselves or spill it anywhere uh, because uh, the uh, nuclear regulatory agency take it seriously. So we have radiation physicists running around with Geiger counters to make sure that we don't spill any of this stuff because if little of that stuff dropped on the floor, you'd never see it. Never had any accidents yet. <laughs> So what to expect afterwards? Over half of my patients feel really tired and not very hungry. And it takes about two to four weeks to recover. The younger you are, the more robust you are, the faster you recover. Say you're 80 and you're kind of a little slow, you know, slower movement, uh, that will, your recovery will probably be a month. A uh, quarter of my patients will, will feel pain or nausea, uh, but pretty much people feel normal back to uh, about a month. If you're really young, you know, in your 30s or 40s, you'll probably uh, get better within less than a week, probably within days. And the major complications, as I mentioned before, are ulcers, 4%, and liver failure is like 1%. Uh, those are the kind of the main complications. And in our Stanford experience, we um, reviewed all the renal cell carcinoma patients that we treated. All of them had clear cell. And uh, three of, we had amazing responses. And that's why uh, we will... Uh, push to treat uh, patients with liver metastasis with radioembolization rather than chemoembolization is because our experience has been um, positive and we published it and we did six patients. We had three complete responses and one partial response. Two patients had just progression in other locations outside the liver that um, couldn't assess that w whether it was successful in the liver or not. But they didn't die of liver disease. They passed away from something else. But uh, the overwhelming uh, results have been positive with radioembolization. What do you mean by complete response? Complete response is when you, we don't say cure, <laughs> but when you don't see the tumors anymore or, uh, that are live in the liver on CT or MRI, we call that a complete response, where you have no detectable viable tumor within the liver. It doesn't mean it's not gone anymore. I mean, it's not there anymore. It could be there, and that's why you have to continue to see your oncologist and continue to get follow-up scans. Because it'll likely come up either somewhere else 
or maybe back in the liver again. So this is an example of a 61-year-old woman with uh, renal cell carcinoma, and that's basically the pictures I look at. Everything's subtracted out, the bones, the soft tissues, the only thing left are the vessels, and the little round balls are the tumors. And we'll inject in the radioactive tracer, and this is what they look like, all the kind of um, pretend tracers kind of concentrate up within the tumors. And then we'll follow this patient over time, getting a CT scan at three months, then six months, then 19 months, then 50, 59 uh, months. And you can see, we'll call this complete response because this is the liver, this is the tumor, which is bright white, and then this is the tumor afterwards, which is dark. And it, they're no, no longer enhancing with contrast, meaning it's no longer viable and you'll see it shrink over time. It's like a scar that kind of gets smaller and smaller because we're not going in there and scooping it out. It has to absorb by the body over time. And then unfortunately, although you get these great responses in the liver, uh, you have growth elsewhere in the body. Here is in the other remaining kidney, you have a tumor, and then within the uh, pancreas, you have a tumor. So that's why you get to need to be continue to be um, follow up with your oncologist and also uh, continue to get scanned. So in conclusion, um, local regional therapy, uh, it's for liver predominant uh, disease and uh, we're not curing cancer, but we're helping people live longer and uh, maintain their quality of life. And we're able to locally treat uh, tumors within the liver or the kidney using freezing or burning uh, techniques called ablation. And it's a minimally invasive procedures that uh, patients can come get treated, go home, either the day of or the next day. And I just call it kind of Band-Aid procedures because all the procedures I just described, um, you just wake up with a Band-Aid. So thank you very much for your attention and yes.